ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of What's Happening. I'm George Bins, and we're continuing with our discussions of candidates for city council at large. And this evening's guest is Will Cosmos. Welcome, Will. Thank you, George. Thank you very much for having me. So you've been in Beverly a few years. Uh, how um, long? Uh, seven years, actually. My yeah. wife and I bought our, uh, our, our first home. Yeah. Uh, in Beverly in 2014, and we've, been, we've loved the city. Yeah. Been here ever since. Our, our kids yeah. are in the schools. Um, uh, now I'm, I'm an attorney uh, with my own practice here in Beverly. I used to work in Boston, but now I yeah. work at the Cummings Center. And actually, this morning, my 12-year-old daughter reminded me that I'm not the first member of our family to be on BevCam. <laughs> that she, really? in fact, <laughs> yeah, she, in fact, um, when she was in fourth grade, they had a project where they um, made welcome packs for, uh, you know, Proposed welcome packs for immigrant families to Beverly and, yeah. and presented them to the school board. Yeah. And so she was on BevCam. So that, I didn't, I right. had forgotten about that until this morning. Okay, that's good. So, <laughs> so you're a member of the family. Yes. Neat. Yes. So you want to run for uh, city councilor at large. Yes. And uh, you got a legal background. Yes. Uh, your legal background is what? Um, I'm a business litigator. Business, and, okay, and I do some real estate litigation too. Yeah, okay. Um, so what I start off with, I guess, with a lot of the candidates is um, what do you think of the state of the city? Um, I think the state of the city is is pretty good. Um, I, I think that there's some things that we need to keep in mind as we move forward. Um, like, for instance, what do you want to keep in mind? <laughs> well, I think that um, the city's been growing a lot. We've been here seven years. Um, our, our kids are in the schools. Um, my my Eldest daughter, who reminded me of the yeah. BevCam appearance, is at, at the middle school, which is beautiful. Looks nicer than uh, than parts of my college looked. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, but um, we need to uh, approach growth responsibly, I believe, in the future. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot of different things, actually. What does um, it mean to you? To me, uh, it means that whenever there's a, uh, a new development that is being talked about, that we think about how it affects the community at large, um, how um, it affects the ability for people, let's say, and that, I mean, that includes how to get around. Mm -hmm. um, is there gonna be parking involved to accommodate extra people? Um, I'd like to see um, uh, whether we can include provisions about adding green infrastructure to these new buildings, for example, solar panels or, or um, cutting down their reliance from, uh, uh, on water being drawn from the Ipswich River and other of our water sources. Um, it, it means uh, being mindful of the historic nature of the city um, and the character of the city as we, as we grow. Um, it means um, making sure that there are places for people to live, that, where they can afford to live, um, and, and it, making sure that it, that it all fits in a coherent plan. Well, one of my hot buttons is affordable living. And uh, we've had Andrew DeFrenza on the, the show a couple of times. He's a good and, friend. And uh, he points out very accurately, we have, quote, affordable housing, 12%, mm -hmm. which is better than the average city around us. But what they mean by affordable is about a $75,000 a year family income. And there are a lot of people working in Beverly that aren't dragging down 75K. Mm -hmm. So you have to, another category of housing that people can afford. That's right. And this disconnect, I think, is glossed over. And I think this is one of the areas where we, we need to get something done. But that's me, and I'm not running, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, Not again. But anyway, <laughs> so we get down to the issue of, okay, we've just built up Rantoul Street. Yeah. Um, is that the kind of development you want to continue, or do you have a different thing in mind? Um, well, first of all, I think that we have a great master plan um, that goes into a lot of the, the different ideas for growth in the city. Um, second, uh, I am a strong supporter of affordable housing. I think that it's essential. Um, here in Beverly, um, that we'd be a leader in that as we are and continue to be. Um, and third, I, I think you're right, that there's a space for what's called the missing middle um, in terms of development moving mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. And we need to think about um, 
part of responsible growth is thinking about where do we put those types of units, how do we get them built, and how do we make sure that the process is transparent so that, that it actually becomes um, a reality as opposed to something on a piece of paper. Uh, I, something I'd be interested in is looking at um, how we could make it easier for people to build out or convert space for in-law apartments, for example. Yeah. We live in a, um, our house, you know, we got here right before the market did. Yeah. We were really lucky. Yeah. And I, uh, that makes me feel like, like, like I have a big responsibility to try to help other people um, get in and enjoy this city that we love. Um, we own a multifamily home. My mother lives in a first floor apartment. Um, and we were lucky because she needed a place to land. And, oh, and yeah. it's wonderful for the kids. It's wonderful for me. Um, uh, a built-in babysitter, yeah. I well, <laughs> sometimes. But, you know, it's also nice to see my mom. Yeah. Uh, she's 75, and it's nice to be able to check in on her without too much yeah. of a problem. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Mom, for telling your age. <laughs> but um, I think that, you know, uh, if we make it easier for people to have in-law suites, for example, in their homes, that um, not only would allow people who are senior citizens who may own property already in Beverly to sell their existing homes and recoup funds from that, um, cash in on the market, if you will, yeah. but also um, will increase the housing stock. Um, there's, I mean, there's only so much we can do to control the market. Um, it's a force of its own. Oh, yeah. But um, we can take steps to try to uh, mitigate its effects. Well, the push in from the government level, next level up from us, um, is we've got five railroads, not five, we're down to four railroad stations now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole idea of this uh, transit-oriented development brings in uh, the expats from Boston who can't afford to live there anymore. Right. So it's sort of emphasizing the same kind of structure we've got on Rantoul Street. And then the other question comes down to, okay, we've more or less finished Rantoul Street. What about the rest of the downtown area. Mm -hmm. Well, I live downtown. Um, I, I live on Washington Street. Okay. Um, and uh, that's an area I think it's important um, that we uh, maintain the historic nature of that area. It's a beautiful place. I mean, yeah. it's me selfishly saying, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, Rantoul Street is Rantoul Street. Um, and it's done and it's built. Um, and as we approach other projects, um, whether they be transit-oriented or otherwise, um, we need to think about how they fit with everything else that's around there. Yeah. That's part of being responsible in, in how we approach these projects and thoughtful. Um, and, uh, you know, transparency is a big part of that. I mean, you know, my wife and I were, were the first, among the first waves of, in the last decade or so, of people yeah. who are expats from closer into Boston yeah. uh, because we could afford it then. Yeah. Um, and I took the train into Boston for work, um, so I know what that's like. Yeah. Uh, I know it's nice to be near a train station. Yeah, it's very convenient. I know I've had to go into Boston for uh, lots of reasons. And uh, if I'm lucky that the place I'm going to end up is within walking distance from uh, North Station. Right. It's a done deal. You can't beat that. Uh, right. Because the train is going to get you there in 30 minutes, regardless of what the traffic is. Right. And, right. Uh, Hopefully, sometimes. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They, they, they do their best. Yeah, yeah that's pretty regular. But uh, beyond just the housing issues, what other issues are you concerned about with Beverly? So um, I'm very interested in the environment, um, in making sure that as a coastal city, we're prepared for climate change. You only have to have been watching the news over the past few days and seeing what's happened uh, with Hurricane Ida, not just reversing the course of the Mississippi River, um, as it did in, in Louisiana, but flooding neighborhoods in New York City. Um, one of my friends posted a video on Facebook of, of herself um, sloshing through the streets of, of Brooklyn. Yeah. And it, it's really unbelievable. And as a coastal city, we need to bear that in mind. We need to have resilient infrastructure. We need to have, um, you know, I live near the, near the coast. We need to have, make sure that our seawalls are, are there and that our drainage and sewerage systems can accommodate what we're gonna face. Um, also, you know, I, I was really inspired uh, to get into this race because uh, shortly after um, I opened my law practice, one of our friends uh, called uh, who lives in North Beverly, um, and she just read an article in the Salem News about the Varian spill um, mm -hmm. that has been um, uh, 
uh, under remediation for a couple of decades now, yeah. and it's still not all the way gone. And um, she asked how I could help. And uh, I've been volunteering as an advisor to VOC North Beverly, which is a group that's yeah. worked together with um, city, state, city and state officials, uh, along with the responsible company, to find a solution and a way forward. Uh, and that's something that really uh, made me realize that I could use my skills that I've developed as an attorney mm -hmm. um, uh, to, um, to help the community and to serve. Yeah. Well, you said to mention North Beverly. Uh, we had a rainstorm came through here before Ida. Mm -hmm. uh, the infamous Henry that didn't <laughs> that fizzled out. Um, but it did pour enough water into North Beverly that they had a flooding situation. And one of the articles in the paper mentioned that it was just like 2011. And I think one of the things that I think a lot of people get concerned about is, yeah, we have these periodic events where we get inundated with water, snow, you name it, whatever. And yeah, that's horrible. But we get an attitude, I think, of, well, that's a once in a hundred year storm. It comes through another 10 years later. Yeah. So I think one of the things I like to hear to understand is how can you help get some of these projects that we thought about doing that eh, we never quite got around to it? Well, um, I'll tell you, you're right. They're not 100-year storms anymore. They're yeah. going to keep happening. Yeah. Um, we, just this summer, we have this, a beautiful old maple tree in our yard and lost a huge branch. Thank goodness it didn't yeah. hit um, anything structural. Yeah. But two, a couple of years ago, we had a branch hit our car. That wasn't very much fun. Yeah, anyway. But... <laughs> but um, as a, as a city councilor, uh, what I can do is advocate for these things. I can investigate what the city's doing to address them, and I can work with my, my colleagues, hopefully, and with the mayor and whom, whomever else in government to try to make sure that they're a priority as we move forward, because they really have to be, um, especially in parts of North Beverly. Um, the, the topography is really like a bowl. If you yeah. go down from Sawyer Road, um, you have people who's like I've seen pictures of ducks in people's backyards when it rains really hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we have to make sure that that we're preserving a city for our kids. Well, you start to mention the working with your colleagues and so forth. Uh, we get down to the question that the uh, charter is up for grabs this year, and there's going to be some recommendations. As far as I've heard, the only recommendation that came out of the charter commission is make the mayor's uh, term four years. Um, but we have a situation where we have a strong mayor, weak, weak city council. So the issue comes down to one of, okay, you get a claim from a constituent that we need to do something. Um, how are you going to make it happen? And the, the thing that bothers me, and you can probably understand as a, a little bit more often, the only tool you've got is line item veto. Mm -hmm. So unless you're willing to step up and vote no on the, the budget, which very seldom happens, if never, uh, there's nothing in between. So how do you fill that gap in between to develop some sort of uh, compromise on a situation or an accommodation? Well, uh, look, um, I've looked over the current charter. I haven't seen the the um, the new charter. And yeah, nobody has. <laughs> well, and, and my training is to, you know, apply the law to the yeah. facts. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what's going to be in it. I have heard the same thing about maybe four year term for the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, as it is right now, uh, you know, the city council has meetings at least twice a month. Uh, and I, I really uh, can't imagine that dedicated public servants like Paul Guanci and other people who have served before, um, were there just to sit and look pretty on BevCam, although it's nice, yeah. um, that there's things that we can do um, as a city council, as city councilors, we can um, bring issues to the fore. I, I noticed that we can, uh, we have subpoena power, for example, I'm not saying I'm going to go use that, but uh, necessarily, but we have the ability to advocate within the city council uh, and to work within the system that we have to get results. And you know, if that hopefully there will be more of a role explicitly laid out than just the line item veto. Yeah. But um, you know, for now, 
look, I'm, I'm, I'm trained to make arguments and to investigate facts yeah. and to also to negotiate and, and make deals. So um, I think that there's a lot of, I guess, in diplomacy, you call it soft power that can be yeah. brought to that position. Yeah. Well, the other issues that keep coming up, you talk a bit about uh, efficiency, I call it. I'm an engineer by trade, so... Oh. I was a philosophy major, so we might not. Yeah, <laughs> might so, need some explanation. Uh, what you talk about is green power and all that. To me, that's efficiency. Mm -hmm. Use less energy. That's a good idea. Uh, better insulation and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, designing the uh, water handling, sewage handling system so that we can accommodate these big storms without having it pump out somebody's basement every couple of blocks. Right. So. These are some of the issues that are pretty straightforward, but when you come down to um, things other than that, the uh, school committee budget mm -hmm. is presented to the uh, city council as a lump sum. And again, it's the line item veto. You can veto the whole thing, but to go back to this committee and say, I don't particularly like this one, can you get something done? Um, you mentioned you've got a daughter in the middle school. Mm -hmm. and, and one uh, starting kindergarten. Uh, okay. Um, so you're more involved. Yeah. Committed. Yeah. And uh, so the question is, um, what do you think about the uh, spending of the school committee? Well. It's, it's one of your responsibilities to evaluate. Yeah. Well, and, and as, you know, we've touched on this, is very personal for me. My, right. my children are being educated in the public schools. Um, I think that we have a responsibility as a community to make sure that everybody has a, um, a fair shot to achieve their potential and to be prepared for the future. Mm -hmm. um, I anticipate, um, if I'm elected, working with people on the school board to understand their priorities before it gets to the budget. Mm -hmm. I think that um, part of a city councilor's role is to be proactive and reactive, and, to re not, and not reactive, to reach out to people and say, well, what do you need? I know, for example, that um, with a daughter in the middle school, that the middle school classes are, tip, are becoming bigger than the capacity of the high school to handle. Um, so we're going to have to make sure that, that there's funding for that um, to accommodate that so it doesn't take away from the educational experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think especially um, this year and, and in the coming years, we're going to have to um, really pay attention to, to our children and how they've been affected by the pandemic um, and make sure that we have resources in place to help them in school. Um, and um, also that the teachers have, have, have what they need to, to, to teach kids, regardless of, of their background or, or socioeconomic status, family status, what have you, whatever's going on at home, um, so that they can succeed. Um, so yeah, schools are really personal for me. And uh, I, I'm eager for the opportunity to get involved in, and know about what, what they really need yeah. and how it fits together. So we've talked about several different areas around it, and I guess we get down to the issue of um, there's a lot of emphasis on ethnic differences. The city's got a director of diversity. The school can be the school has one. Um, there's been in a motivation on the part of the school district to make it a sanctuary school. Um, where do you fit into this kind of a discussion? Well, first, I think that diversity gives any community strength. Um, I think that uh, a diversity of experience, background, culture, religion, what have you, um, is important. And it's important for a dynamic, thriving community to have. Mm -hmm. um, I I uh, think that it's very important that we have those diversity um, initiatives on the city level and in the schools um, and that we're addressing them uh, because uh, it's important that we're an open and welcoming community to all people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, as I believe I mentioned uh, when I was putting my microphone on before, I'm the grandson of immigrants yeah. uh, on my father's side. Um, I have a great deal of of, of, I identify with, with people who are new to communities uh, and who face 
difficulties there. My family faced difficulties in Chicago when my dad was growing up. Yeah. Um, so I think we should be doing everything we can uh, to make sure people's minds are open uh, so that we can continue to grow and, and be welcoming to everybody who wants to live here. Well, this sounds like a lot of good ideas, but what I'm trying to get into is um, exactly how do we make this happen? Um, one of the things that has come out of some of these discussions we've been having is uh, the city is 93% uh, of European extraction, mm -hmm. and the rest is split with uh, different uh, identified minority groups. Uh, the school committee pointed out to me that uh, the school is 76% European and 24% of uh, other ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a disconnect there that there's, there's a different kind of problem between the city uh, side and the school committee side. And at the same time, uh, how do we get the, our arms around some of these problems? Other than, yeah, you can have some guy who's assigned the job of go talk nice to everybody and make things happen. But how do we really make something happen or something different? Well, um, I, respectfully, I think his job is more than just to talk nice to everybody. Okay, um, what do you think, what but, do you think but, he should but, be doing? But I think it's, it's to make sure that we have programs in place to, to welcome people who are new to the city who might feel excluded from the city, um, that we have programs in place in our schools um, to be able to help people who need more help, um, uh, to, uh, that we're thinking ahead towards when some of the federal funding that right now um, uh, provides for free school lunches runs out so that kids can be ready to learn. And this is not a, um, this is not a minority versus European extraction issue. This is the, cuts across the board. Um, one of my daughter's first friends when she took the bus uh, on her first day to kindergarten was a foster child. Um, and I think that that's a wonderful part of her educational experience. Yeah. Um, so what we need to do is, um, is to work with groups that are already here that, that are advocating for many of these things yeah. and to make sure they have the support they need and to, and to really, you know, challenge ourselves to embrace a dynamic and growing community that's different from how it was, yeah. but could be even better. Well, the kind of things that keep popping into my head is that uh, way back when uh, I moved into Ellington, Connecticut, that was one of the first time we bought a house, and uh, shortly thereafter, the welcome wagon showed up, mm -hmm. and they had a basket of goodies they got from local merchants. Yeah. And uh, that was a process that was run independent of the government mm -hmm. to welcome new people in. I haven't seen anything like that in 50 years. I just <laughs> met with some of my neighbors actually about starting something like that in our street. Um, I think it's a great idea. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done at the neighborhood level um, because at the end of the day, these are community and interpersonal issues. And we have to, you know, we are a community. We live in yeah. a community. We choose to live in a community. And that's where we need to deal with these things. Yeah. So uh, we've run about a half an hour of fun. I can't believe it. Oh, yeah. This, these go very quickly <laughs> once you get involved in them. And uh, as we usually do on these shows, uh, we turn the camera over to you. Oh. And uh, okay. you can make your sales pitch. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, as you know by now, and it says in your screen, my name is Will Cosmas, and I'm a candidate for a city councilor at large here in Beverly. Um, I'm an attorney. I'm a uh, husband, a father, a homeowner. Um, I've got kids in the schools, and I'm a small business owner here in Beverly. Um, I, I love this place. I'm really bought in, and I think I can really make a difference. Um, and I, uh, I want to bring my skills uh, to serve the city and to serve uh, its people as we move forward through these exciting times. You know, it was about 400 years ago that, that settlers from, uh, from Europe uh, first uh, began to create a community here. Um, about 150 years, and they were British subjects, about 150 years later, they were shooting at British boats from Independence Park. Yeah. Um, there is, uh, they wouldn't recognize the city now, probably. And that's, in many ways, a good thing. Um, there's a lot we can learn from their mistakes, um, and 
uh, but we should hold on to their optimism and their grit and their integrity uh, and their, uh, their focus in terms of building and working together to make this a better place. And um, uh, I look forward to being a part of that and seeing what kind of a, a, a Beverly we can build together. Yeah. Well, we've had a couple of discussions with uh, some of the people around town and I've asked this question before of uh, what's the character of the city? And uh, get also to different answers. And you mentioned the area that you're living in has got a certain historic nature to it. And there's some brand new stuff up on Dunham Road and mm -hmm. the Cummings Center yeah. and all this. And uh, one of the comments was made, the character of the city has changed. That's right. And Because if you look at the, the south end of Ransoul Street, those are the old factory buildings. And I, and I work at the Cummings Center. Yeah. You know, and I love to see all the, I love that they kept the old equipment from the shoe there. Yeah. Um, it's the character of the building. It's mm -hmm. something to remember. It, it uh, was one of those smokestack industries. They had a big foundry and uh, they had all that characteristic. But this is part of the city and that's what we should be uh, saving, I think. And that's the tough decision. What's worth saving and what's, uh, let it go. It's yeah, and, and that is, uh, that's something that um, I look forward to engaging in as a member of the city council. Yeah. Okay. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will thank you very much for joining us this evening. And we will continue to have these discussions with the candidates. Uh, you're running for uh, at large, which means you're in the primary. So. Oh, no, there's no primary. No primary? No primary. No. I'm off the hook till November. Oh, you're off. The <laughs> then you got a long slug ahead. We do have yeah. a long slog, but so, it's worth it. In any event, uh, when it comes down to the both the primary and for the election, the most important thing is get out and vote, because you can sit here and complain with me and listen <laughs> to my thoughts and so forth and somebody else's, but until you vote, it doesn't make any difference. And uh, I couldn't agree more. Thanks again, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time.